like this author, most of your time in the Midwest is spent in Michigan, you might come to think that the Buckeyes are a beastly, culture-loose people, their native Ohio a fetid hellscape. After all, they managed to set a river on fire a few times, and that takes a measure of doing. Michiganders, basically, are a sound bunch. But as my only memorable experience with Ohio had been the actual fetid hellscape of the state's turnpike, I thought it best to explore the place for myself. The order of the day was a museum-to-museum -museum run from the edge of Lake Erie down to the flats of Dayton. The museums in question? The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. The Hall of Fame opens at 10 a.m., the Air Force Museum closes at 5 p.m. Just over 200 miles separate them. If I were to see both, and do so in proper style, I'd need a steed to fit the mission. Something fast, glamorous, and a little preposterous, preferably with some semblance of aviation history. The Mercedes AMG S65 Cabriolet fit the bill nicely, a four-place convertible with a V12 and a quarter million dollar price tag. The Rock Hall, mostly, is a monument to its own desperate desire for importance. Sure, Cleveland's Alan Freed was the first big DJ to spin rock and roll records, but Ohio's best rock and roll came from the margins. Akron's Chrissy Hind, living as an expat in London, founded the Pretenders. One of America's earliest hardcore bands, Maumee's Necros, spawned the vital independent touch and go records and contributed Andrew Wengler to the CD staff. Rocket from the tombs, from Cleveland, split up, resulting in both Priyubu and the Dead Boys. The latter's Sonic producer was sampled by the Beastie Boys. If there was a monument to the late Stibators in the Rock Hall, I missed it, but the Beasties at least got a little kiosk up in the rafters. Honestly, the best thing about the place was that Billy Gibbons's Eliminator Coupe was parked in the basement. A perfect execution of the early 1980s full fender style before things got too pastel and smooth, the red 33 Ford still commands respect. I snapped the photo of the coupe and headed for the door. I hadn't seen everything, but I'd seen enough. The second coolest thing in the rock hall was the custom hammer special guitar that Cheap Tricks Rick Nielsen gave to John Lennon not long before the Beatles' death. Nielsen surreptitiously cribbed some measurements from Lennon's Rickenbacker, sent them to Hammer's Joel Dantzig, and had him gin up an instrument built to have a similar feel. According to Dantzig, the whole thing happened pretty fast, it was always that way with Nielsen. Oh, and I need it in 10 days, was usually the instruction. The guitar featured the Marzio pickup spoon specially for Hammer, and a thinner neck than the production Hammer special, so that it might play more like Lennon's Rickenbacker. Nielsen came up with the Rick and Truss rod cover, making the heads tuck read Rick and Hammer if once printed hard enough. Apologetically, car enthusiast Don Sig noted, Sorry I don't have more interesting details and specific skid pad figures and 0 to 60 times, but I can tell you that the special trail braked well and fit into a lathe hall parking space. The S65, however, does not fit into a lathe hall sized parking space. The dreadnought bass convertible is 198.6 inches long, about 8 inches longer than a Bentley Continental GT convertible. Size, however, does not always correlate with perceived masculinity. Leaving the garage at the Rock Hall, the attendant commented, Nice car. Thanks. It's not mine. Oh. The wife's? She had a point. While the S65 coupe is a pure shot of highly refined testosterone, the convertible roof adds a gender-bending quality. If Ziggy Stardust flew in today, they'd send one of these for him. If Lady Gaga doesn't already own one, we'd be shocked if an S-cab isn't on order. Slade Savehill could drive this car, and nobody would bat an eye. Conversely, a half-dressed muck with a decent haircut could also look right at home, if he's comfortable entering derision for perpetrating a measure of affect. Plutocrats for a classless society, we've found your chariot. It's got 621 horsepower, turns out 738 pounds to foot of door, bolts to 60 miles per hour in 4.1 seconds, and clears the quarter mile in 12.3 at 120 miles per hour.
putting the serenity and guts to use, I headed for Columbus, which I'd heard from friends as a pretty swell town. Notably, this praise comes from New Yorkers, not Michiganders. In my Californian ignorance, the only thing I know about Columbus is that Family Ties was set in its suburbs, and Alex P. Keaton really seemed more like an E-class sedan sort of guy. I stayed just long enough to fill the tank, which the V12 sucks dry to the tune of 16 miles per gallon, and put my foot down for Dayton. The National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, which we covered extensively in this photo feature, sits on the right field portion of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Its runway services the final flights of aircraft inbound for display. JFK's Air Force One made its last landing here, as did the C-141A Hanoi taxi, the plane that brought American pals home from Vietnam, then went on to serve through the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. There were planes in the place I'd waited practically my whole life to see, aircraft like the Bristol Bue Fighter and the Fock Wolf FW 190. The museum is stocked with aircraft that blew my mind as an aviation-obsessed elementary school kid, like the YF-12A, the entrance step between the CIA's A-12 Oxcart and the aviation world's equivalent of the Lamborghini Countach, the SR-71 Blackbird. The A-12 is basically an SR-71 armed with missiles. At the age of 8, you just knew that the only thing better than a Blackbird was an armed Blackbird. While the Enola A resides in the Smithsonian, Boxer, the silver plate B-29 that bombed Nagasaki, is in some ways more significant. Uranium-238 is tough to extract. Plutonium-239 is an easier isotope to produce in quantity, but it requires a more convoluted, precisely engineered design to go boom. The Manhattan Project's chiefs decided to drop the uranium gun little boy because they knew the bomb's design would work. The plutonium implosion fat man was already en route by ship to the 509 composite bomb group space on the Nian Island when Oppenheimer's gang blew up the similarly constructed gadget outside Alamogordo, New Mexico. If Hiroshima ushered in the atomic age, Nagasaki ensured rapid growth of the nuclear arsenal of any country that could figure out the implosion process required to reach critical mass. Throw in the fact that an implosion bomb serves as the triggering device for a hydrogen fusion device and, fundamentally, Boxer delivered the weapon that set the stage for two decades worth of nuclear deterrent policy, until ICBMs rewrote the atomic warfare rule book. I wandered onto the recently opened fourth hangar, a building containing hot rod specials like the sole remaining XB-70 Valkyrie, the fastest of all the hypersonic X-15 rocket planes, and the utterly bizarre Ravrocock, a flying saucer developed by Canadians with the support of the US military. I wandered through Sam 26000, the first plane to wear Raymond Lewis Classic Air Force One livery. The Boeing VC-137C was the craft on which Lyndon Baines Johnson was sworn in as its crew prepared to fly Jack Kennedy's body back to Washington, D.C., and even now, with its seats glassed off from the aisles, forever enclosed in an Ohio hangar, the 707 derivative Bruce's Portant. Pure to its fundamental mission as VIP transport and to its hot rod badge, the S-65 Cabriolet handles like an S-Class. Which is to say that the AMG treatment is not imbued with the violent, grip ring, and touchy personality of the C-63. Removing the roof from the coupe does, however, engender a bit more flexibility than one might expect from Stuttgart's most famous manufacturer of bank vaults. We pulled 0.91 grams on the skid pad, better than the 0.88 grams we saw with an S-550 Cabriolet although it doesn't match the 0.94 grams we got from the Dodge Charger Hellcat. Which, as you may remember, is, somewhere under all the posturing, related to a Mercedes from way back when. After leaving the museum, I found myself trundling down a narrow road under a canopy of trees, following the signs to Huffman Prairie Flying Field. I'd read about the place and David McCulloch's The Wright Brothers. After Orville and Wilbur made history at Kitty Hawk, they returned to Dayton to further refine their flying machines, testing them in a large pasture owned by Torrance Huffman.
the field was open and serene, impossibly lush in a way that California only really sees in March. Away from the somber aura that pervades the Air Force Museum, Huffman Prairie holds the same sort of reverent hush that you find at the empty Bonneville Salt Flats, a fundamental quiet baked into its being despite having been shot through by mechanized history. It's where two brothers clambered into the sky and made flight a viable thing. The Wright's work at Kill Devil Hills proved a hypothesis. Huffman Prairie was the spot where flying became something that people actually did. As I hopped on I-75 and headed north for Detroit, the smooth hump of the 12-hole ingot under the S-65's hood thrust us ever forward, the sun dipping low off the port side. I dropped the top and the radio spun up the psychedelic furs pretty in pink the superior original album version, not the overproduced, sax-laden rendition from the John Hughes movie soundtrack. Even with the wind whipping through the cabin, Mercedes air cap anti-buffeting system doesn't work as well here as it did on the E-Class drop top, the hefty Burmester sound system reliably swirled the music up, around, and through me. A great sung and an open road on an absolute highway star is a finer experience than all of the rock hall, to be sure. Special and yet somehow unpretentious, the Big Benz goes about its business without fuss. The S65 Cabriolet remains more automobile than bourgeois bubble. Some say the V8-powered S63 is car enough. To be sure, it's a fine automobile, but you want the full V12 effect. There's no rational reason to spend the extra $77,195, but the additional four cylinders somehow complete the machine. At this spending level, the cash is academic, pointing out that one could purchase both an S63 Cabriolet and a Porsche 718 Boxster S for less than the price of an S65 misses the point. After all, the big AMG still undercuts both the Rolls-Royce Thon and the Bentley Continental GT Speed Convertible. The V12 Biturbo Badge sends parking valets into ecstatic apoplectic fits. Don't make the mistake of taking the S65 Cabriolet as a variant of a lesser car, it's its own machine, one that stands on its own peculiar merits. And as for Ohio, it's best not to believe the Buckeyes neighbors to the north. A place that gave us Art Arfans, Steve Baders, LeBron James, and Longaberger baskets can hardly be hailed as a one-note void, and indeed, the state is worth a visit. Just give the Rock Hall a miss.